I'm really pleased to uh, be able to introduce one of our relatively new faculty, not the newest anymore since we've had a um, big influx of new faculty, which is always exciting. But uh, for those of you who uh, aren't as familiar, don't know Dr. Stark, she uh, came to us a few years ago, did her pediatric surgery training at the University of Washington, and has a specific interest and expertise in what remains one of our more complex uh, pediatric surgical disorders. Again, everyone assumes that all their babies are going to be healthy when they decide to get pregnant, but you never know when that you're going to encounter a congenital anomaly, and this is one that continues to uh, have room for improvement in terms of treatment. So I'm really honored to have uh, Dr. Stark talk to us this morning about what's new and what's going on in pediatric surgery at diaphragmatic hernia. Thank you. Um, Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I think I've met almost everyone in the audience, but just for those of you who don't know me, um, I've had the good fortune of being of joining the faculty here about two years ago. I did my general surgery training at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and my pediatric surgery fellowship at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, my areas of interest are in pediatric surgical oncology and congenital anomalies. I live in Midtown with my family, and I recently had a baby who is now eight months old. Uh, the um, original research that will be presented at the end of my talk here is funded by a Children's Miracle Network grant. This is a um, preview of the main points of the lecture. We're going to do a brief overview of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. We'll go over the mechanical and physiologic components. I'll go over current research strategies um, and our current research that we're, um, that we're doing here, as well as future directions in kind of the global direction of treatment for um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So it is a very severe birth defect. It's characterized by a defect in the diaphragm and pulmonary hypoplasia. As you can see from this slide, um, it kind of represents a classic diaphragmatic hernia. It occurs most commonly on the left-hand side of the patient. Um, abdominal viscera are herniated into the thorax. There's lung hypoplasia on the ipsilateral side. The contralateral lung is also classically affected. There's mediastinal shift. And sometimes even the liver can be partially herniated up into the chest, which we'll, you'll see is an important prognostic factor. This is a classic chest x-ray from a neonate born with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. You can see the entire left side of the um, chest cavity is replaced with um, intestine. It's um, both a common and severe birth defect. For us, um, 4 in 10,000 live births is actually a relatively common congenital defect, and it's one of the um, defects that pediatric, surgeries, pediatric surgeons are very used to dealing with. It has a very high mortality. This 50% mortality represents all comer mortality, so this includes um, stillbirths, planned abortions, and spontaneous abortions. In terms of um, live birth mortality, it's probably somewhere between 30 and 40%, but still um, ridiculously high. There's about a 30% additional associated anomaly um, rate, and those anomalies are mostly cardiac anomalies. Some of them are functional and some of them are not functional. We really don't know why this happens. Um, there is thought that it's either a spontaneous mutation or a perinatal event that happens very early on in gestation. There are some syndromes and genetic defects that are associated with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, but those are, are extremely rare, um, and the vast majority are probably spontaneous. In terms of both the defect size and lung disease, um, there is a lot of degree, a varying degree of severity. Most babies have a pretty severe defect and are present in the neonatal period. On, the, on this slide on the far left, you can see there's a, a post-mortem slide. This baby had complete agenesis of the diaphragm. There's a spectrum of the diaphragmatic defect from complete agenesis to even um, smaller defects with an actual hernia sac. The, it's rare to have a hernia sac, um, and more commonly they present with a near agenesis or at least 50% um, loss of the diaphragm um, on the side. There is pretty severe lung hypoplasia associated with the disease. This is a postmortem of a baby who did not survive, and you can see that that ipsilateral lung is, is severely affected. Um, very rarely we see patients who present later on in life. Um, this is a 10-year-old that presented here. 
he came in with an upper respiratory tract infection and got a chest x-ray. He has a, um, a very non-significant congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And so this is kind of the spectrum, and I would say it's more of a rare case that we see these later in life present presentations. Um, it's um, primarily a prenatal diagnosis. Currently, the published mean gestational age of diagnosis is at about 24 weeks of gestation. However, um, sonographic techniques and technologies have been improving um, greatly over the last decade, and this diagnosis is being made earlier and earlier, especially at fetal centers across the country. This allows for earlier intervention and um, is particularly important for our research. So figures A and B are MRI images of a baby with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and this is at about 26 weeks gestational age. Just the interesting things to point out, which I think you can probably see without a pointer, because they're labeled, um, is that the intestine and stomach are both up in the chest, and you can see a small hypoplastic left lung. The um, figure, figure C is an ultrasound image at the same time. What they typically look for for the diagnosis is that stomach, the stomach bubble and the intestine are at the same level of the four-chamber view of the heart and where the right lung is sitting. And that's how we make the diagnosis. Uh, one thing that's important to tell you guys about right here, um, and many of you may know about these things, but there are indices that we use um, that tell us about prognosis for the babies, and it helps us with um, fetal counseling for the parents. Um, one of these is a lung-to-head ratio. Having a small number um, uh, ha gives you a worse outcome. And um, more recently, we've started doing actually um, MRI lung volume calculations, and that seems to be a little bit more specific in terms of how bad the pulmonary hyperplasia will be postnatally. Um, the other thing to kind of note on prenatal imaging, which is not shown here, is that sometimes there can be liver herniation up into the chest, whether it's a right-sided or left-sided diaphragmatic hernia. And that is um, bodes a, for a particularly poor prognosis. So aside from having a um, high lethality, this disease also carries with it um, some significant long-term morbidity. Um, in terms of chronic lung disease, um, depending upon how bad their hypoplasia is, these kids can go on to have um, a chronic need for home oxygen, pulmonary um, hypertensive medications, they're susceptible to infections. Almost all of them um, exhibit abnormalities in PFTs and up to about five years after birth and um, have some sort of decreased exercise tolerance. There is um, across the board gastroesophageal reflux disease. Sometimes it's asymptomatic, but it's usually um, present, and that's because there's displacement of the GE junction with the diaphragm repair. There is neurodevelopmental impairment, which um, happens actually 30 to 50 percent of the time, and this can be both cognitive and motor. Um, and in terms of the um, cognitive aspects of it, um, hearing loss seems to be the most common um, impairment that we see. We don't know why, um, and some people posit this because these babies end up getting more um, chronic antibiotic use than other babies, but we really don't know. Um, chest wall defects are another big morbidity associated with this um, disease. When the diaphragm is eventually fixed, about 50% of the time we have to use a synthetic patch to repair it, and this puts undue tension um, asymmetrically on the chest and can cause chest wall defects like pectus carinatum and excavatum, but even more severely or um, uh, more importantly, scoliosis. So despite all the progress that's been made in this disease um, in the last 50 years, we still have um, pretty unacceptably high rates of mortality and morbidity. And so when we start thinking about a solution for this problem, um, I think we really need to understand the whole disease. And um, one thing that people ask a lot is, why is this disease so lethal and so morbid? I mean, isn't it just a hole in the diaphragm? And of course the answer is no. Um, and really I think the name of this disease should be congenital pulmonary hypoplasia with a diaphragmatic hernia because it's really the pulmonary hypoplasia that adds to the significant mortality and morbidity. So I think it's helpful to think about this disease process um, from two standpoints, a mechanical standpoint and a physiologic standpoint. They're obviously interdependent and interrelated, but um, I think it's a helpful way to address the problem. So in terms of mechanical problems, the diaphragmatic defect um, results in a loss of barrier function, and that's part of the mechanical issue. Um, viscera herniate into the thorax, and that causes a restrictive process on the lung. But in addition to that, um, the 
The diaphragm does not function normally. It's a primary respiratory muscle. Even in utero, there are fetal breathing movements that are thought to contribute to lung development, and this is not happening on that side with the diaphragmatic hernia. Um, in terms of um, pulmonary physiology, the main um, pathophysiology of the disease is due to the pulmonary hypoplasia and actual lung maldevelopment that happens in utero. So there's both a loss of um, surface area for gas exchange and also severe pulmonary hypertension due to this hypoplasia. And it's ultimately this persistent pulmonary hypertension that makes this disease um, so, so morbid and ultimately makes these babies so sick. Historically, the diaphragmatic defect and the um, pulmonary hypoplasia have thought to have um, had a causal relationship, but now modern research has kind of um, borne out the fact that these tend to happen in parallel, and they're actually two distinct aspects of the same disease process. Um, but um, the diaphragmatic hernia does not cause the hypoplasia in and of itself. Certainly it contributes because lung development happens throughout um, fetal gestation, and that is impaired by the restrictive process from the hernia, but it um, does not explain the entire hypoplasia. So where do these overlap? Um, this defect occurs, the diaphragmatic defect occurs um, between four and 10 weeks gestation. Um, critical lung development um, happens throughout gestation, but specifically there's um, branching and uh, of small vessels and um, um, bronchioles between the third and 16th weeks of gestation. Um, the hernia that, the her, uh, herniated viscera for the diaphrag defect, diaphragmatic defect impacts this stage of development, um, but like I said, these are two independent parts of the disease process that are kind of happening in parallel. And throughout gestation, you have continued growth and remodeling, and this is impaired by the hernia. This slide is just a, a nice picture of intrauterine lung development, and you can see that critical development does happen somewhere between the fourth and sixteenth week of gestation, but continues throughout fetal gestation. Um, in this picture, you can see that the author of this paper, who's a pretty famous pediatric surgeon, posits that the time for intervention is postnatally, and, and this is because um, infants and children are still doing a lot of pulmonary remodeling and growing after birth. And so I think that's why these babies are able to do so well and survive with such severe pulmonary hypoplasia. But I would actually posit that potentially um, earlier intervention would be better, such as fetal intervention, because you can get more bang for your buck kind of entering in the stage of lung development early on. So the primary pathologic derangements in this disease are due to pulmonary hypoplasia and maldevelopment of the lung. Um, this leads to pulmonary hypertension and um, severe impairment in gas exchange. This is a picture which kind of um, demonstrates the point that in lung babies with um, CDH, um, who we've looked at lung architecture in, show that there's um, decreased branching of small airways and blood vessels, but also um, smooth muscle hypertrophy in small arterioles and capillaries, and even down to the alveolar capillary um, unit, where there really should be no smooth muscle cells, there's thickening of these smooth muscle cells in the, media, in the medial layer of these capilla capillaries. And so this um, picture on the, in the middle is an H&E slide from a baby with persistent pulmonary hypertension Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is one of the causes of persistent pulmonary hypertension, and you can see not only um, a very thickened medial wall of that vessel, but you can see that the interstitium is quite thickened as well, and potentially you can even see that the alveolar are smaller than they should be. Um, I couldn't find a, a neonatal picture of a normal lung, but this is an adult um, lung with a pulmonary capillary, um, sorry, a alveolar capillary unit. You can see that the vessel is very thin-walled, there's not very much in the interstitium, and there's a lot of surface area for gas exchange, which is not present in CDH babies. The other thing that I want to just mention while this slide is up is that even though there is an excess of smooth muscle in this media, it does not function like normal smooth muscle, and it behaves erratically to both stimuli for contraction and stimuli for vasodilatation and often has a very exaggerated response to normal, um, normal things that would cause vasoconstriction like hypoxia and acidosis. And so once this pulmonary hypertension starts, it's very hard to control and modulate. 
and some and this is why classically some of these babies are actually refractory to things that we commonly use like inhaled nitric oxide for vasodilatation in adults <clears throat> I'm sorry for this somewhat um, busy slide, but really all you need to take from it is that there are certain things that cause vasodilation and certain things that cause vasoconstriction. This is an endothelial signaling pathway, so this happens in the lung, this is specific to the lung. Um, things like elevated levels of cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP cause vasodilation. Um, things like acidosis and um, hypoxia work on this endothelium one pathway and cause severe vasoconstriction. There are drugs that work along these pathways and I'm going to talk a little bit about them um, later on and we'll show the same slide but I promise I won't spend a lot of time on it and the important thing to note is that some of these drugs like prostacyclin and nitric oxide actually have an anti-proliferative effect on the smooth muscle of these cells and so they can be used to kind of remodel the vascular system in these disease processes. Um, you don't have to look at any of the words on this slide, you just have to know that um, this side is abnormal and this side is normal. This is a CDH, uh, like a depiction of a CDH alveoli and this slide is just showing you that the interstitium is thickened, it's filled with myofibroblasts, we don't know exactly why, and the alveoli are smaller. And um, this author calls it alveolar block and it basically is an explanation for the impaired gas exchange that happens. This is the last slide that you have to kind of really think about. and. Um, because it's fetal circulation, it's, it's an important part of the disease process. So in addition to all this pathology that's going on around in the background, um, this baby, when it's born, is trying to make a transition from fetal circulation to normal postnatal circulation. In fetal, and that can often be arrested in babies with CDH because of extreme um, pulmonary vascular resistance. So in normal fetal circulation, what you have to think about is that the oxygenated blood is coming from the placenta, most of it is supposed to go to the brain, so it is um, shunted away from the lungs. So 90% of the fetal circulation never sees the lungs. Um, the 10% that does go there um, is, is circulated through. There are two shunts that make that possible. There's one in the atria, um, the foramen ovale, and then there's um, the ductus arteriosus, which goes from the pulmonary artery to the um, aorta. In patients with, uh, in normal patients, when babies are born, they have a ex um, very quick precipitous drop in pulmonary vascular resistance. That starts to shunt blood um, through the lungs. When that happens, the left side of the heart um, develops a relatively high pressure, the right side develops a low pressure, the foramen ovale closes. The ductus um, can stay open for hours to days after, after birth as part of a transitional circulation, which is still considered normal. In babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, they get this, um, at birth, they tend to get this rapid decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance, which kind of gives us what we call this honeymoon period after birth, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But in that time period, you tend to have um, relatively normal physiology. Something happens, be it um, some acidosis, some stressor, some hypoxemia, which causes a rapid increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And when that happens, although the foramen ovale is typically closed, that ductus is a pop-off valve for the pulmonary hypertension, and you get shunting of blood through the ductus, um, which actually further worsens the hypoxemia and further worsens the vasoconstriction in the lungs. So in terms of current treatment strategies, um, I think it can be divided into fetal intervention and postnatal intervention. Right now, um, the fetal intervention that is um, uh, being researched is um, fetoscopic tracheal occlusion, and I'll explain that in the next slides. Um, and that would be done um, in, um, in utero, and then the diaphragm is repaired after the baby is born. The postnatal um, surgical repair is either primary or passage assisted repair of the diaphragm. Our medical adjuncts are ECMO, um, high frequency ventilation, and then um, these pulmonary vasodilators, many of which are, are very experimental still. When um, talking about fetal intervention, I think it's important to just mention that there has been an enormous amount of research into um, the fetal repair of the diaphragm. And um, these studies were done at UCSF um, under um, Dr. Michael Harrison, who really is one of the fathers of fetal surgery. 
And he wrote nine papers. They all have the exact same title, but just with a different Roman numeral. Um, four of those papers were actually clinical trials in, um, in humans. This is a diagram of, of one of the ways that they were trying to fix the, the defect in utero. Um, ultimately, um, despite their persistence and dedication to the refinement of the technique and the fetal operation, there was really no difference in outcomes and arguably worse outcomes for babies that underwent um, repair in utero. And so this has largely been abandoned. Currently, fake fetal tracheal occlusion is an alternate um, prenatal therapy, and it is thought to reverse some of the pulmonary hypoplasia, and in animal models, they've actually had a lot of success with this. There is a current ongoing um, clinical trial um, uh, that is open to enrollment now. It's happening at um, very few fetal centers across the country, and it's uh, limited by geography for most patients. The um, criteria for admission to this um, clinical trial is also pretty strict, and I can talk about it a little bit later if people have questions about it. Basically, um, with um, a fetoscope, a tracheal balloon is introduced somewhere between 22 weeks gestation and 30 weeks gestation, depending upon the severity of the CDH. This balloon is left in place, and um, the theory behind this is that um, the lungs are basically net producers of amniotic fluid. That fluid um, is not allowed to aggress when that balloon is blown up. The lung dilates because of that. With the dilation, there's um, growth hormone secretions, and the lung actually is able to kind of combat that pressure from the diaphragmatic hernia. Um, this is a picture. Um, depicting a severe a baby with severe um, congenital um, diaphragmatic hernia compared to one that was treated with fetal tracheal occlusion. These are both pictures taken at birth. Um, and um, this is kind of an exciting new therapy. Our fetal center will be part of this trial, um, and once we know the results, it will probably add to our armamentarium a treatment for this disease. So what is the um, current standard of care? Well, it's repair of the diaphragm after clinical stabilization. I'm sorry for those of you who have not seen um, Princess Bride, because it doesn't make sense. Um, so this is the current standard of care for babies born with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Um, CDH has become more of a physiologic emergency um, rather than a medical, em I mean, a surgical emergency. And historically, when babies were born, we used to rush them to the operating room, thinking that repairing the diaphragm would help with pulmonary hypoplasia and the lung mechanics. Um, we actually found that it was detrimental. It adds an extra stressor before the lungs are able to remodel and accommodate um, to the stress of being in an extra uterine environment. And so that has also been abandoned. And so now we wait for medical optimization and stabilization of the baby. And so what does this really mean? So basically at birth, um, if there is a prenatal diagnosis, um, which in most cases there is, unless the mother has not had prenatal care, the babies are intubated, and this is to avoid bagging, bagging the baby and causing further barotrauma to which they are very susceptible. <coughs> um, there is sometimes a honeymoon period, like I talked about before, um, and then after that, usually they develop some, some level of pulmonary hypertension and become sicker and sicker. Medical therapy, which I talk about on the next slide, is what we do for that, but in the case of persistent severe hypoxemia, um, acidosis or instability, the babies will be offered ECMO as long as they're candidates um, as a rescue and a way to stabilize them before surgery. Sometimes um, this takes weeks. And that's not common, but we often um, aren't operating on these babies within the first 24 hours of life. It's usually 24 to 48 hours, and if they go on to ECMO, it sometimes can be weeks before they actually get their diaphragm repaired. In terms of medical therapy, um, we use gentle ventilation, which means low volume, high frequency to avoid barotrauma. Um, systemic blood pressure is maintained because we need to um, have end organ perfusion, and this is done with vasopressors. Um, we do pretty aggressive correction of the acidosis because it contributes to the um, vasoconstriction of the lungs, and we use um, pulmonary vas vasodilators. <clears throat> And these are used in conjunction with systemic vasoconstrictors. And so this um, critical care management, although I've kind of simplified it on this slide, can be very complex and very dynamic. And it, you tend to need to be at the bedside continually adjusting things um, in order to get the baby to stabilize. 
I'm going back to this slide because I just want to point out a few of the vasodilators that we use. Um, two of these are in a bit, uh, are in enrolled are in open enrollment for a large clinical trial that is IV sildenafil and prostacycline, and the prostacycline is on the PGI2. And these are open clinical trials for um, persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborns. Congenital diaphragmatic hernias are considered um, part of that um, grouping, and so um, we are planning to join enrollment so that we can have access to these drugs. But basically, um, they increase cyclic GMP and CAMP and have um, smooth muscle remodeling processes that are very important, especially, and a lot of these drugs, I'm sorry, are used in adults for um, pulmonary hypertension now. Um, none of them, aside from milrinone and um, uh, nitric oxide, are FDA approved for use in babies. So we have a lot of data from adults, but very limited data in babies. and. Um, in addition, I think that with babies, you have a lot more capacity for remodeling, and so these drugs might actually have a much more profound effect in babies than they do in adults. So in terms of postnatal surgical repair, this can be done um, laparoscopically, thoracoscopically, or in, with a standard open technique. Um, the viscera are reduced, and the diaphragm is typically closed either primarily or with a patch repair. About 50% of the time, a, a patch is used to repair the diaphragm, and usually we use Gore-Tex now um, or some other kind of permanent synthetic match, mesh. And there are a lot of long-term problems with this repair. So main problems are recurrence of the hernia because of the tension on the patch, so patch failure. Um, which has been cited as happening about 30% of the time in patch-repaired um, babies. Chest wall deformities are present, um, including scoliosis. And this is an x-ray of a three-year-old that we just saw last month in clinic who had a, um, a neonatal repair of her congenital diaphragmatic hernia with a mesh. And looking back at her other images, she had a nice domed diaphragm on that side, but now you can see that it's um, very flat under tension, and you can imagine that the pulling of her chest wall there is not helping um, the curvature <coughs> of her spine. So this is a big problem. Less commonly, um, there are bowel obstructions and infections of the mesh associated with that. Mechanically, what's the problem with this repair? Well, it doesn't grow with the baby, as you saw on the previous slide, and it's not functional. So there's no respiratory function in that patch, um, and that's an important part of lung development even after um, the baby is born. So to quote Dr. Farmer, um, this seems like a problem with a stem cell solution. <laughs> And so we're really looking at the mechanical issue of this disease um, with the hopes of our future goal being to address um, both issues simultaneously. And so the goal of our project was really to design and produce a, an autologous um, stem cell-derived muscle patch for the repair of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And the concept would be to be able to harvest placental stem cells, which are fetal cells, from a baby who's been diagnosed with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. We typically would harvest the cells via chorionic villa sampling. That happens between 12 and 16 weeks of gestation. We would take those cells, um, isolate myogenic cells from that, from that cell batch, and seed them onto a degradable patch. During the baby's gestation, um, that patch would be um, co-cultured with these cells. And then ultimately, this patch would be used to repair the diaphragm. And this could be done in the neonatal period or even potentially in the fetal period. And essentially, we've used the fetus's own cells to replace, a, to grow a new diaphragm for a replacement of their um, absent diaphragm. And the idea would also be that this patch would degrade over time, just leaving muscle cells behind. So um, this, these are the broad aims of our project. Um, the first aim was to isolate and characterize these myogenic progenitor cells from placental stem cells, and then use these cells um, on a seeded patch um, and now we are using um, SIS, which, as you know, is an FDA-approved um, hernia repair uh, mesh. Creation of an animal model for this disease so that we can test um, our diaphragm both functionally and um, look for the presence of cells and engraftment. And we have just recently started on this animal model, so I have some data to show you. <coughs> 
This is a schematic from our grant proposal, which just shows um, the harvesting of the stem cells, co culturing of the stem cells, and isolating out myogenic cells out, and then placing those on a scaffold, either a nanofiber scaffold or SIS, um, creating a defect in a rat, and then placing this patch in the defect space. A lot of the background research for this, um, which makes this project possible, was done um, by Dr. Kabagambe and Lee Langford um, under the direction of Dr. Farmer and Dr. Wang. Um, they were able to isolate these um, uh, myogenic <coughs> progenitor cells kind of fortuitously. The, their lab has successfully used placental mesenchymal stem cells in the treatment of spina bifida for years. And early on, um, both Dr. Wang and Dr. Farmer have been thinking about other diseases that stem cells can be used for um, therapeutically. When looking at these placental mesenchymal stem cells, they noted that there was this morphologically distinct cell population, which I can show you on the next slide. And when they handpicked those cells and cultured them out, um, they discovered that they were actually myogenic cells. This is really important because other groups who have tried to um, culture or cause um, stem cells to differentiate into muscle cells have been pretty unsuccessful, and most of the time they differentiate into fibroblasts. And here we have this pretty robust population of um, true myogenic cells, <laughs> as evidenced by the markers here. We were able to get these cells to grow on a scaffold. Um, the scaffold helps with alignment. and um, this nanofiber scaffold can actually be um, uh, changed based on, on your desires. So the thickness can be altered, the fiber direction can be altered, um, the porosity can be um, altered. So in terms of our current in vitro studies, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but um, basically we are, I, we've isolated this line, we're seeding it on scaffolds. Right now we're using SIS. We're taking those cells and um, looking at how they grow over time and at what density um, is the, at what, what is the optimal density for seeding of these cells and when should we be implanting these cells into a rat. Um, these are some of our preliminary conclusions. So this seeding density seems to be the, the optimal density. Um, this is a picture at four weeks on um, SIS. And this is what we're using in our rat model. So recently, we've um, started doing rat surgeries. Sad to say, early on, there were a few rat deaths. But we've kind of um, figured out our technique. We use adult female sprag dolly rats. Um, through a laparotomy, we make a diaphragmatic defect. We do immediate repair of that defect with, with a patch. Um, and that patch has no cells or has our myogenic um, stem cells. The animals are cyclosporin treated, so they do not reject these human cells. And then we do an in vivo and ex vivo analysis of the cells. The in depth um, surgical approach is that the rats are intubated. We do a midline laparotomy. We make this defect with an aortic punch, it's a four millimeter defect. Earlier on, we were making much larger defects, but we had um, almost 100% mortality with that. Um, and then we are repairing these defects with a six millimeter SIS patch with or without the stem cells. So it, with this animal model, we can do um, some in vivo um, as well as ex vivo work. We're looking mostly for stem cell retention, if any. Um, not all stem cell models are based on the retention of cells, and a lot of the models are based on just the paracrine effects of the stem cells themselves. And so there's no guarantee that these cells will be retained. Um, we want to see improved natal muscle, native muscle ingrowth and um, eventual replacement of the patch with normal diaphragm. The uh, myogenic cells are transfected, transfected with luciferase. Um, and when exposed to luciferin, um, it undergoes a chemical reaction that emits um, a bioluminescence. And an IVIS imaging um, machine can pick up that bioluminescence. So it's a way of looking for the cells while the animal is still alive. Our ex vivo analysis currently will include um, just basic H&E staining and immunohistochemistry of the cells. This is a picture from just last week um, looking at a control, which is on the um, left-hand side of the screen, and a rat with our um, stem cells. 
I can't say a lot about it right now because we haven't had a lot of time to analyze it, but um, looking under high magnification in the microscope, you can see that there are actually um, myogenic cells in the middle of the patch, which seems to suggest that at eight weeks there was some retention of those cells. We still have to do immunohistochemical staining on this um, to be certain. The next image I'm going to show you is um, an IVIS image. So this is what I was kind of talking about before. The rats are alive, and you can look for cells um, um, with this machine. And so on the um, on your screen left is the ECM only, which is the control rat, and then on the right is um, a 20 at 24 hours post-op a rat that has retained their myogenic cells um, and is um, bioluminescing. So we were pretty happy to see that there were some cells that were still present um, after our surgery at 24 hours. This is pretty preliminary work, and so our future directions are um, mostly to kind of refine our cell technique. Um, and so we will be potentially using growth factors or ligands and doing some hypoxemic conditioning. That can, um, when we put them into the rats, they're in an anoxic environment until we get some angiogenesis. And so it's important to kind of optimize and augment the cells to encourage retention. And we'll be doing that through a variety of means. Um, we need to still optimize our in vivo work um, through um, correction of the technique and do further IVIS evaluation. Eventually we will do some functional analysis of the diaphragm and obviously we will continue to do some immunohistochemistry to make sure that there are myogenic stem cells there and that they're actually human and that there are some in, there is some ingrowth of the endogenous muscle cells from the rat. So I think that this is a novel approach um, and it is um, something that uses the patient's own cells. It's uh, kind of like a designer um, solution to this problem and it will eliminate a lot of the current morbidities associated with um, patch repair. In terms of big picture goals, I think that we need a combined approach to the treatment of the disease. Um, it's still fairly morbid and st fairly lethal and I think that it warrants um, an aggressive uh, treatment strategy. And I think that this would include um, some kind of fetal intervention like fetoscopic tracheal occlusion in combination with fetal therapy with pulmonary vascul vascular remodelers. I didn't tell you this, um, and I meant to on that kind of busy biochemical slide, but in um, babies and animal models of CDH, there are deficits in these normal signaling molecules. And so replacing those in the fetal period can actually help with remodeling during the intrauterine phase of lung development. And that is something that people are actively looking at in animal models right now and has really promising um, results. In addition, I think that using an autologous stem cell patch will um, negate all of the morbidities that are associated with patch repair. And this could be combined in a fetal approach or done in a neonatal period after the baby's born. I want to acknowledge the entire um, Farmer Wang Lab um, who have given um, me the infrastructure to do some of this research and have done a lot of the preliminary research, um, specifically um, our residents Sandra Kabagambe and um, Laura Galgansky have worked a lot on this project um, with help from everyone else in the lab as well um, under the direction of um, Dr. Farmer and Dr. Wang. And um, one of the, um, our student volunteers, um, Chelsea Lee, has done almost all of this um, in vitro work. So I want to thank her as well. These are my references. And happy holidays. <laughs>
uh, fibroblasts, particularly if you use the uh, placental uh, source, uh, those cells, uh, uh, what I understand, just uh, differentiate into anything. And what are the tricks of maintaining uh, your progenitor cell as that my committed myogenic stem cell, particularly when you're using something that just differentiates in that? Mm -hmm. Luckily, in culture, these have stayed as myogenic stem cells without a lot of augmentation. You know, other labs have tried um, in culture to direct um, a differentiation with different growth factors to try to maintain the population as myogenic, and most of those attempts have failed because it's very difficult to maintain muscle cells, and they, like I said, differentiate into myofibroblast or fibroblastic cells, which you're right, are not ideal for the use of muscle replacement. You want an actual functioning muscle cell. Um, we've been pretty lucky because, at least in vitro, these cells have stayed um, as a pretty um, <coughs> homogenous population of myogenic cells. And we're hoping that this will be the case when we do immunohistochemical chemical staining of our rats and um, in vivo work will demonstrate that it stays and remains myogenic. Does, uh, <coughs> have you played around with uh, things to actually make the cells contract in culture and does that perhaps keep them pure? Well, not yet. Uh, that's a very good idea. Um, we haven't really got to that phase of the um, study yet, but um, it's a really good idea because there are some papers that suggest that stimulate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's a way of trying to direct them where you want them to go by stimulating them within the normal muscle milieu, but um, we haven't done that yet. We, we all think this is going to work. <laughs> although it's a very interesting problem because you're right. Um, I think, and my bias would be that I think the wound healing in an acute phase actually probably helps us with in growth of the patch and those sorts of things. And we kind of know that because in repairing diaphragms, um, especially when we were early on doing it thoracoscopically, um, actually just the smooth diaphragm reapposition had a higher hernia recurrence and so people started cutting out sections to get like a fresh wound healing to get it to adhere. So I think actually it will probably help us and that will be a bias in our favor. Um, and it doesn't actually recapitulate what's what we expect to happen in a real neonate. Um, so it's something to think about and something we're gonna eventually have to correct for, I would assume. Um, your first question, it's very early and we haven't seen nerve ingrowth. I'm hopeful that because um, you know, there will be paracrine signaling and, and whatnot with the stem cells present that we might be able to get something like that. Our patch is fairly small, and so I think that if it was gonna occur, then we would have a greater likelihood of it occurring just because it's so small and there's such a lot of endogenous tissue around it. I have a few questions also. The first one, and I have to say I'm quite ignorant about this, is what's the static, status of the phrenic nerve on the side of the diaphragmatic hernia? So I don't know the answer to that. So that's a really good question. Um, that phrenic nerve is not functional, and it's uh, we don't even know if it will function with these patch repairs. A lot, <laughs> a lot of people actually postulate that because the diaphragmatic or the phrenic nerve on that side doesn't function, that's what's actually <coughs> leading to the pulmonary hypoplasia. Because I'm sure you know they have these models of pulmonary hypoplasia where they actually ligate the phrenic nerve and you get pulmonary hypoplasia just like a congenital diaphragmatic hernia just because there's not this ability for the diaphragm to help regulate inflow and outflow of amniotic fluid and help with lung growth. So I 
I believe that this uh, nerve is probably defective, and I'm not sure how much we can reverse in that. But anatomically, you guys see a nerve. Yes. When you operate, right? You don't it's see it onto the diaphragm, but you can see it uh, in yeah. the normal thoracic spot that it should be in. And then my second question okay. is, the phrenic is there, yeah. but it doesn't function great. And the reason we, we know this is so there was a while we were fantasizing that when we did the lat flaps, we put the forward dorsal up to that crappy piece of phrenic, and we actually measured EMGs on those. And we got a little bit of signal, but it was really clunky. Yeah. So that it's it, it, there's usually a little sort of whiskey thing there, but it's certainly not a normal thing. Yeah. And then the other question, and this this would be conjecture. I just wondered what your thoughts were, maybe not the farmer's thoughts. Is this seems like the ideal uh, fetus to put into an artificial womb and correct the defect, and then let them grow to the point where you think that it's reasonable to deliver the fetus. You know what I mean? Where you have much more control over it. I wonder if you guys have thought about that as well, or if anybody has. Tell, the artificial, tell people what the artificial womb is. Oh, so the artificial womb, um, it's. Baby uh, in a bag. Baby in a bag. Um, <laughs> a lot of the development was done at CHOP, and it's a, a way to um, kind of recapitulate the human placenta via a machine and a bag with the baby in the bag. And recently there have been um, pretty promising but very preliminary um, sheet studies with the artificial womb. Um, and eventually, I, it was just recently in the news, um, I think, um, and there's a lot of controversy about it, but I think eventually there probably will be a human um, option for that. And it would probably be a disease process that would be very amenable to um, to kind of having that incubator <laughs> time to heal. I don't know what your thoughts are. Rosie? What we found on repairing CDHs in utero, the reason we went to the conclusion was because the easy ones to fix are the same ones that are easy to fix post natal. Yeah. And those kids didn't need fetal surgery. And it turns out the ones that were really crappy are the ones that were liberal. <laughs> That's the beauty part about the bag, though. You could do it slowly over time. You could you don't have that option. But it's sort of it's the same sort of concept with fake little food. So the whole point of that is sort of this gradual reduction of the hernia as well as growth of the lung and stretch. Um, sort of the that line. Um, but I think the problem is right now is that those balloons aren't getting through. So when this whole thing with the um, ID physiosis would be up to you. It is interesting, too. Uh, you know, when you've got a lifetime of, of time to work on one single problem. So Mike Garrison and his ten, his nine publications under the same title, there were a lot of lessons learned that it's hard to do when you're just two years in the lab or three years in the lab or four years in the lab. Are you still in the lab, then? <laughs> so, yeah, but I will say, I think, I would be interested in what my colleagues think about this, but I think it will be less than a decade that you could do a combination of in vitro fertilization, maybe two decades, and grow a human being completely outside the womb. Um, the ethics and the challenges around all of that are really interesting to contemplate, but you know, we're pretty close. When people first cloned Dolly, Everybody thought that was, you know, the sheep in Britain, that that was just unbelievable and impossible and miraculous. And now that kind of um, work is done in, in animals all the time. It's pretty common. And um, so I think we're going to get that. Dr. Uh, really fascinating talk. It sort of covers so many of the disciplines, you know, from anatomy and physiology and biochemistry and Sergio, I'm, I'm wondering where, um, if there's a mechanism or how you get all these disciplines together to talk about this problem. Maybe, <laughs> is there a meeting that everyone comes at, or is it really parsed out into different groups? I mean, how, how do you get everybody together for this? I mean, it's true. <laughs> yeah. um, this is something that, um, you know, we talk, we are in very constant communication with the NICU about. We have rounds um, specifically dedicated to these babies. Um, our new PEDS chair um, who's coming here is an expert in pulmonary hypertension and will have a lot of interest in this disease. I think he'll have a lot of interest in helping us get on these clinical trials, which we really need to be part of. Um, but one thing I didn't mention in this talk, which um, is maybe counterintuitive, is that um, these Although the surgical aspect of this disease seems to be like the, the 
the least dangerous part of it or the, the least um, you know important aspect. Surgeons classically manage these babies. I mean, and in fellowship, we were primary caretakers of these babies and did all of the medical management for the babies. So it really has been a surgical disease, um, and surgeons have kind of had to learn all of this stuff and be part of these conversations with the neonatologist in order to um, kind of help this baby adapt. And, and then on a national or international level, what, what kind of societies are dedicated to this or meetings, or where do you, where do you present this work? to get other input? There are many. So, um, you know, all of these big ECMO meetings talk about congenital diaphragmatic hernia because it's such an important part of the treatment strategies. All the fetal meetings talk about this. You know, we, we go to fetal meetings. Um, some of our data was actually presented at our last fetal meeting. Um, so those meetings, even, um, you know, like uh, pediatric surgical meetings, there are always CDH stuff being presented, and then certainly at AAP, which brings neonatologists and pediatricians together, there are a lot of big talks about this. And the International Pulmonary Hypertension Meeting. Yes, and the International Pulmonary Hypertension Because pulmonary hypertension in newborns <coughs> is actually more common than congenital diaphragmatic hernia. It happens about 0.2% of the time, and, and it's a real problem. And congenital diaphragmatic hernia is just one cause of that, but it's a, it's a big, interesting problem. Um, and a lot of it has to do with all of the same reasons that the age of hypertension. Just again, if you think of uh, how much we assume that our our babies are going to be normal and our children are going to be well, and the how game changing this is <coughs> in the middle of a pregnancy to find out you've got some kind of problem. Dr. Wang, I think it's appropriate for you to have the last word today. Sure. So I just want to add to uh, what has been presented. I think this is one of the best examples of how engineering, especially by engineering, can help surgical disease treatments. So I think we have, I mean, this example of research can be presented at the biomedical engineer and the meeting too. Yeah. So I was talking to a biomedical engineer at Emily about like potential Q32 example in the training. And this is kind of the to a very specific application and how like stem cell biology by material uh, by engineering approaches can be applied to an easy treatment. So Dr. Wang is here to help you all. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays everybody. <laughs>